It is time for episode 12 of season 4 of the Gospel of Arguments podcast. Today, we're going to do a biography of a very misunderstood person in church history, John Nelson Darby. Let's get after it. Welcome to a new episode of Gospel Lord Gimmicks. I'm your host, Richard Storm and Norman. Here to tell you everything I know, some things I highly suspect. Yes, I know, I don't have my glasses on. I left them in the truck. I do not feel like going back out there. I kind of press for time right now trying to get this podcast squeezed in here in this little bit of a window of time I have. So I don't feel like going out there to get them. The price is probably getting chilly out there. I don't know, it's supposed to rain tomorrow. But anyway, today I thought we would do what I always do when I don't have a lot of time to prepare for a podcast and uh, do a biography. Plus, you know, I didn't want the whole season to go by without us doing at least one biography. So we're going to do one today. One of the classes I'm taking this semester at Asheville Baptist Institute is called Dispensational Authors. And we recently went over some of Darby's work, so I thought we'd do an episode on him. Sounds like a good idea. But before we get into that, how are you doing? How are you doing And what is the last episode for the next two weeks? Last episode until November 11th is what this one is. So... Two weeks that y'all gonna be without gospel every gimmicks. I mean, now y'all go a month usually when it's you know in between seasons, but I, I hope y'all will remember it is for a good cause. It's for a good cause. Speaking of the good cause, my tux came in. Well, mine and my brother in law's tux, the other two guys, they opted to pick theirs up from the store for some reason, but got my tux. This is the box that came in. It's hanging up there, but the shoes are in here. But I got my tux. I put it on a minute ago. It fits, but man, I don't think tuxes are for me. I don't think tuxes are for me. Not very comfortable garments, but it fits. It looks right, so it's all you can ask for, really. So, got tuxes. They're di- they're di- they're here. I didn't ever show y'all my ring. I don't think I ever showed y'all my ring. I've had this for like a month or two. Uh, if you're watching on the YouTube video it probably just looks like a black ring because that's basically what it is I don't like fancy things fancy ain't my thing black good to go so I gotta give this back to her she gave it to me to hold so she wouldn't lose it but I need to give it back to her next week sometime Uh, church events let's talk about them so I think I mentioned it. I had it wrote down, didn't I? What did I do with my book? It's a mess around here, I'm telling you. I'm a daggone mess. So Revival's over with. Finished that at Wednesday. Uh, November 2nd, Fall Festival, 11-4. I told you we got bounce houses and rock climbing walls, mechanical bull, all that stuff, and then other things I don't know nothing about. Like we got we last we had this. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna have it this year, but last year we had these inflatable balls you get inside and you need race or something. I don't know. I don't understand things like that. Pony rides, stuff like that. And then the following Sunday, which would be the next day. Our pack of pew service begins at 11 a.m. And that is where we try to see how many people can squeeze in a build. And I try to try to preach the gospel to as many people as possible. That'll be November 2nd and 3rd at Grace Missionary Baptist Church, 4411 Springbank Road, Green Coast Springs, Florida. So with that being said, we're going to play a special video now from... Uh, a couple 
a couple ladies that would like to say goodbye to y'all. And uh, after that, we'll get into the main topic. Y'all want to say goodbye? Y'all want to say goodbye to the to the audience on YouTube? Since this is the last video you're going to be in. Well, you got to get back. You got to get back from the camera so they can see you. Say bye, Coco and Lily. John Nelson Darby, born November 18th, 1800, in the city of London. The youngest of six sons, his father was John Darby and his mother was Anne Vaughan. It came from a land-owning family in Leap Castle, Kings County, Ireland, which today is called County Offaly. I'm sure that's not how the Irish say it, but. He is the nephew of Admiral Henry Darby, and his godfather was Lord Nelson. If you don't know your military history, you look up Lord Nelson, Battle of Trafalgar, and that's how he got his middle name, John Nelson Darby, from Lord Nelson, his godfather. He graduated Trinity College in 1819 as a classical gold medalist. I have no idea what that means, but he was a classical gold medalist. Became a Christian in college. It didn't really say that. The information I was looking at and I'm using Wikipedia and Sword Searcher. You know, because you can't trust what you see on Wikipedia. So I checked it against what they had on Sword Searcher. Uh, so the, the belief was he became a Christian in college, if not before then. But uh, almost became a lawyer. He joined an inn of court in of court which is apparently a law school because I had to look it up because I didn't know what in of court is but apparently it's like what they have in the UK for law schools but he left due to his faith he didn't feel like Christianity and being a lawyer was compatible with one another I don't know about back then but if you you know know anything about lawyers these days that's probably true he was ordained in 1825 as a deacon in the Church of Ireland. And then he was ordained as a priest one year later. He became a curate in Delegany County Whitlow. And I had to look up curate to see what that was. Basically from the description they gave, a curate was basically like an associate pastor. Basically. Uh was known for convincing Catholics to leave the Catholic Church. And he was, uh, he became well known for that, for getting the peasants to leave the Catholic Church and come to the Church of Ireland. But, uh, you know how it usually, when you get famous at something, it usually <laughs> ends up being your downfall. So the Archbishop of Dublin ruled that Converts must swear allegiance to George the Fourth, the rightful king of Ireland. So in 1827, he resigns his cur curacy because he didn't like the whole having to swear allegiance to King George thing. He didn't like that. So he resigned his curacy, began questioning the theolo theology he had been taught. And then over the next five years, he began to change his views. He began to change his views on what the Church of Ireland had taught him, as far as theology goes. Begin, believed the very title clergyman was a sin against the Holy Ghost, because it, it led people, he, in his view, it, it led people to believe that God could only speak through the clergy, and he didn't believe that. He believed God could speak through anybody in the church. I have to say I agree with that. 1827 to 1828 became part of an interdenominational meeting. Kind of some, you know, a couple dudes getting together talking about theology kind of thing. That sounds like a fun event. 
This meeting included people like Anthony Norris Groves, Edward Cronin, J.G. Bellett, and Francis Hutchinson. I don't know who any of those people are, but I thought I'd put them in there in case you want to look them up. In 1832, this group of uh, people he was hanging out with became known as the Plymouth Brethren. 1831 to 1833, he participated in the Power Scourt Conference, where he publicly described his ecclesiology and eschatological views, including the pre-tribulation rapture. He officially left the Church of Ireland in 1831. He defended Calvinist doctrines whenever they came under attack by uh, the Church of Ireland. You might be asking why I put that in there. Because it seems like every time I do a biography, somebody in the comments will point out, oh, well, he believed this, or oh, he hung out with so-and-so, or, you know, they'll point out some flaw with the person I did the biography on. And listen, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. That's why I put that in there. Obviously, I would never defend Calvinist doctrines. But he defended Calvinism. Calvinism was a big thing back then. I don't agree with it, but I put it in there just to show you before anybody wants to jump in the comments. Oh, he was a Calvinist. Nobody is perfect, okay? Some people can be right about some things and wrong about other things. That happens all the time. It happens all the time. Traveled across Britain and Europe starting assemblies and giving lectures. America embraced Darby's teaching on eschatology, but not so much his teaching on ecclesiology. ecclesiology. In 1848, a dispute among the brethren led to a split, that w which was, according to what I read, basically over it, the ecclesiology thing. The way, or, you know, how the church, they think, should be organized and ran. Some agreed with him, some didn't. They split. You know, happens. Took five missionary journeys to North America, 1862 to 1867. Mainly went to New England, Ontario, Great Lakes. One extended tour to uh, Sydney by way of San Francisco, Hawaii, and New Zealand. Translated the Bible into several languages. Wrote, this is mainly like a, this part here is like a little chunk of uh, what he did, like as far as writing goes. Okay, so the battery in my camera died. So we're going to pick up where we were. <clears throat> At least I think we are. We're going to start right here. So he translated the Bible into several languages. He wrote synopsis of the Bible and many scholarly articles. He wrote hymns and poems. One being called Man of Sorrows. I've not read it, but it's out there. He was a Bible commentator. Writing Writings were published in 32 volumes from 1866 to 1881. He declined to contribute. Let me try that again. He declined to contribute to revise ver the revised version, even though they consulted his work when they when they did that. He died in 1882 in Bournemouth, Dorset, England. He was known not in in <clears throat> now in the article I was reading. They, they called him the father of dispensationalism, and <laughs> no father of modern dispensationalism I'll give you that one but dispensationalism like Darby taught it wasn't necessarily new people think it was people think oh Darby created dispensationalism not really if you look at the Bible and you look at writings way before Darby you'll see that people were kind of leaning in that direction a few people throughout history were kind of leaning in that direction but you know, that's how it works sometimes. You got progression. Progression up to a point where someone finally takes everything that came before him and puts it together and goes, oh, oh.
Dispensationalism made popular by C.I. Schofield, obviously. Schofield Study Bible. Still one of my favorites. Probably my favorite Bible, to be honest. I don't know. Charles McIntosh uh, greatly spread Darby's work, which uh, to the point where if you ever heard of Watchman Nee or Witness Lee, they were inspired by uh, McIntosh, who was inspired by Darby. They called it the pre-tribulation rapture theory. Not to me, it's in the Bible, pretty, pretty plain and clear. He predicted the nation of Israel over 100 years before it even happened. So that's Charles Nelson Dorby. Biography to get us to this two week break so I can go get married. That's all I got for you today. Hope y'all enjoyed that. I thought that was, you know, most of the time we do biographies, I have a hard time finding stuff on the person, but there's plenty plenty on Darby so I don't agree with them saying oh he invented dispensationalism and whatnot with well, like I mentioned before dispensation of the words in the Bible four times and as we was learning in my class this week if you read some of the early church fathers you'll see hints of it in their work you know throughout church history and Darby just happened to be the guy that put it all together and said, oh, this is what, you know, they're alluding to and whatnot. And, you know, in my opinion, people who who stray from dispensationalism, it, it leads you down a path toward all kinds of bad doctrine. But that's another episode altogether. I appreciate y'all joining me today. Sorry about the battery dying. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention, apparently. I thought it was fine last week. I thought it had all kinds of time left on it. Anyway... Appreciate you joining me for everything you need to know about the podcast, including me, social media, where to find it, the latest video. Visit the website at stormanormer27.wixsite.com slash gospel over gimmicks. That's a, I can't wait to shorten that. We're going to shorten it after the wedding. You know, after I moved in, after the wedding. We're going to shorten this because it is. Y'all just saw it go across the screen. And you see it. I can barely fit it across the screen. So I can't wait to shorten it. If you'd like to support the podcast with a donation, you can go to patreon.com slash gospelovergimmicks and become a patron. A beloved patron. Speaking of beloved patrons, our patrons are Joanna Garrett, Roger Waters, Leanna Williams, and Rusty Williams. The wonderful, the wonderful group of people that make this possible. If you want to subscribe to the audio portion of the podcast, it can be found at Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Pod, Podcast Addict, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. I appreciate y'all joining me today, like I done said, but I, I appreciate it. So I just, just got to keep saying it. So the next time you see me, I'll have something on this finger. I'll be in a completely different location, which I think is if hopefully I, if I get it set it up, it's kind of echoey in there. So I'm hoping that once I get some stuff on the walls, it cuts down on the echo. Otherwise, I'm going to have to make some modifications. But uh, it's going to be cool. I I got it all planned out in my head how I want to set it up. But uh, I guess we'll just see next time, November 11th. Until November 11th, take up your cross, carry on.